Hello all and welcome to the LA Experiential Learning Opportunity Online with our notable alumni series. And we are so excited today to have with us Anidra Edwards. Anidra Edwards is an alum with a Master's of Fine Arts from American University in Film and Electronic Media. Uh, Anidra is a visual effects editor for a Marvel Studios production. She was previously the VFX editor for season one through three of CW Network's DC Comics uh, television drama, Black Lightning. Anidra has over 10 years of experience of editing both scripted and non-scripted content. Her editorial experience includes Netflix, HBO, BLT, National Geographic, Discovery, NBC, and Warner Brothers. Anidra worked as an assistant editor for season two of the HBO comedy series, Crashing, uh, for Discovery Channel's Naked and Afraid franchise, for Animal Planet's The Puppy Bowl 7, or 12, I'm sorry, and for Bravo Network's Million Dollar Listing Los Angeles. As an international editor, Anidra worked under the global arm of the Discovery Channel, where she prepared their shows for broadcasting in Latin America and Asian countries. Tell us a little bit about your journey from American University out to LA. Um, I worked uh, one year in DC after graduating in 2015. Prior to also to moving to LA, I had already researched what I needed to, uh, the qualifications I needed to join my union. So I had already started kind of building that kind of uh, resume of things before I left DC. So I built up a pretty, uh, pretty healthy uh, reality TV show background. Um, and then let's see, 2015, um, actually in 2016 was when I made the move to LA. And so once moving to LA, I kind of relied on a lot of the same, um, I guess the same techniques that I used to network while I was in DC. So I used to use staffmeup.com uh, to find editorial gigs. And so I use that same network out here. I started there because it seemed like a great <laughs> starting point. And I actually got my first um, assistant editor job within like a, I think like 30 days. Pretty much after that, I just needed my first union job. <laughs> so that was the goal. And so I networked my butt off out here. I uh, used what I could from my union as a non-member, like to find people that I could talk with. I shadowed a lot of people, a lot of assistant editors that I started to meet, editors. Um, I shadowed a lot of people in scripted content because I knew that's where I wanted to go. Uh, that was one of the main reasons I moved to LA. And so after um, a bunch of like talking in meetings, putting my name out there, going to mixers, all these different things, I finally got my first union. Uh, show, which was Naked and Afraid. I want to ask you, uh, Anidra, about joining the union, um, mm -hmm. because some people will work their entire career and not be part of the union. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me about how you felt that was uh, a great help to you and why it was important to you to join the union, the, the union that you belong to. Yeah, Motion, Motion Picture Editors Guild, um, which falls under IATSE, or I-A-T-S-E. Um, so, that union, I had researched it mainly because I had been a freelancer and a contractor in DC so long, and I had negotiated so many things just on my own. And so coming into the union allowed me to always have a base rate. Um, I could have a base to start my um, to start my negotiations at. Also, my uh, retirement, all of that is looped into me being with the union, my health insurance, everything like that versus as a contractor doing a lot of that by myself. So I knew that being a union, I would, a union member, I would have a lot more resources open to me. Yeah, I was able to um, communicate a lot with other people associated with the guild. So that definitely was a, a plus for me why I wanted to join. Uh, students are coming out now out of college. They've just graduated. Um, any advice for them in terms of the good hard skills or soft skills that they need uh, to be successful in this industry? The advice I would give is don't rule out a lot of options in terms of like just getting experience, just getting you these skills. So yeah, always look at local television. There's a lot of opportunities there. Um, I would also say in terms of just for editorial for me, 
um, or just editorial in general, learn as many programs as you can, and, but become very well trained in several. How are you being as collaborative as you can? Are you using like Frame.io or are you like constantly on the phone or on Zoom calls? Um, we use, well, it's definitely like Zoom. Um, we've used even FaceTime. Uh, we use programs such as Clearview and Evercast. I would definitely say that we have to work a lot harder for the communication. Um, there's a lot of things that organically happen when you're in a room together and you're talking and some things you find out through osmosis when talking, but here you don't have that, you know, when everybody's away from their home. So, um, so yeah, it's a, a bit of a challenge, but we make it work. How um, do you really see Avid becoming like the go-to visual effects software like for the future? But in terms of visual effects editorial, I still feel like Avid's gonna, um, Avid is still kind of controlling that a bit. Um, now, if you go into the onion of visual effects, because I'm just on the editorial side, the show side, there's also what's called the vendor side, which are visual effects companies that actually create those final shots that you see. Visual effects editorial, we work in tandem with picture editors. So we have to be able to use a software that they're also using. And so you also want to like choose your systems wisely when you start mixing, um, because you still want to be able to, um, you want to be in a place that, you know, somebody can go behind you and do that work, um, especially if you're working in like multiple teams. What are some of the challenges that you face on a day-to-day -day situation when you're editing? I would say one challenge, making sure we get stuff out on time. We send constant outputs and exports. Um, we're sending them to studio executives. We're sending them to vendors. We're sending them um, to a gamut of people and then also like getting the episode out. So you want to make sure when you um, when you're sending something for review, you have everything in there. You don't want to send things multiple times. Um, so for us, it's like cutting in the visual effect shots when they're done and making sure that they're in there, that they match. If there's an issue, knowing what the issue is. Uh, sometimes the aspect ratio is different. Um, sometimes you may have had an artist who um, painted out a boom pole, but then they missed a mic <laughs> somewhere else. And so it's mainly about making sure that we catch a lot of things. We're those second eyes. Um, and that's kind of the fun part of visual effects a little bit. You're a bit more reactive. What is the difference and some of the similarities between editing reality and scripted content? Um, so reality TV, the, uh, there's definitely differences in terms of the amount of content that you'll have. Reality TV, they'll film for, I guess, weeks and weeks, months and months, and you'll have a ton of stuff that you probably won't even use. So there's way more content. As an assistant editor, when I was in reality TV, I definitely was hustling a lot more in terms of, um, I had you know four or five editors that I was working with, and we only had maybe like two assistants dedicated to a show. So you will work around a lot of different personalities and a lot of different um, wants and needs. And definitely reality TV, you are flexing your, you know, if you thought you do software, you're like trying everything to get it out the, out the door. <laughs> and um, you, really, uh, you really enhance some of your troubleshooting skills in reality TV. How did you prepare your, for your first months uh, in Los Angeles? Save as much as you can. This is just a ballpark. I mean, 10,000 is great to save when moving. Um, I know that can be a tall order, which is why I took that year um, away from AU. I didn't move to LA immediately. Um, I had a few people in my cohort who did move before me. And so that's who I used for my, uh, my visits to LA. I went to visit them to see how did they adjust? How was, how were they working? Plan a little bit, like I said before, before you come. If you uh, haven't, I guess if you haven't signed up, there's the Entertainment Alumni Network under AU. And so I met a lot of people through there that I contacted and set them up or, or set up like little coffee dates or meeting meetings with. Um, I definitely worked a lot of my, um, a lot of my DC contacts. Um, if you can't move, start to like get yourself oriented, you know, with, uh, you know, organizations or 
Um, you know, I always tell people the Television Academy is a great place to start. Um, because they offer a lot of things um, online as well. If you're looking to try to network with people who are already here or, you know, any part, that's always something that I pitch. So when you were interviewing um, to get those editing jobs in fiction, mm -hmm. did your experience in reality, um, was that an issue? I, it depends on how you spin it. Because there are producers who will look down on reality and say, oh, that's, that's that, you know, and we're scripted and whatnot. And so I really made a connection with people who I interviewed with who were comfortable with my reality background. So that made it easier for me when coming in. We just emphasized me knowing the software. Um, and I had changed my resume a number of times to try to like help with when I had such a heavy reality background coming into um, scripted, you know. So I would put like, um, more of a skills-based resume than a chronological resume. Um, I also had like one or two uh, jobs that I had done that were very quick, but were below the line positions that just gave me a scripted credit. So I was a post-production assistant for like a weekend. <laughs> and I did that for Netflix's show Bloodline. And it was literally just to get something scripted on my resume. What is the one question we didn't ask that you think we should have asked? The question of uh, where, where do I see, I guess, the politics going right now of our country and the effects of entertainment, um, especially with Black Lives Matter movement and that has been going on since before, you know, this period of COVID and to um, have it really kind of broken more boundaries with corporations and companies and especially uh, Hollywood studios there is a lot a lot of movement here uh, to try to actually take some tangible steps um, in diversity there's a lot of companies who have kind of said that they put diversity at the forefront but it's been evidence that they they haven't and so it's a great time to see that there are really some actual changes happening um, also with COVID-19 and uh, everything that has been shut down, there's kind of, once we, once everybody can open, there's going to be a splurge of work. There is a ton of stuff that is coming out the door um, because dates have been changed, they've been moved. There's a ton of like companies trying to hire uh, people, even if it's quickly. I've seen someone who said, I need somebody yesterday, <laughs> you know, to come on and just for, for you know, even like remote work and night shift work and stuff. And so if there's any time to try to get your foot in the door, like right now is the time. Putting this series together is a team effort. And even when we are apart, we are a team together. And I wanna thank Nada Maloof uh, for the concept and outreach to alumni, Felicia Parks from the SOC Career Center, Hannah Shows, visual design, Olivia Hugastrat, alumni emails, Tia Millage, and Brianna Williams for web promotion, Matt Seklecki, logistics support, and Rebecca Castaneda for post-production editing, and our School of Communication Dean, Laura Donardis, our staff and our faculty who champion innovation.